And thank you, Peggy, for playing us uh, for us this morning. And um, thank you for listening to us. <laughs> Just thanks in general. Just thanks in general. Yeah. We made it this far. <laughs> it is a neat thing to say, though, that Jesus saves. I mean, it's... It's a very positive thing to say, and it's a neat thing to lean on, is that fact. I want to let you know a little secret about myself. Uh-oh. says, I don't like nightmares. Anybody in here like nightmares? Okay, I guess that's a good thing. We've got a unanimous vote that nobody likes nightmares. I think my worst nightmare, I'll share this with you, I think my worst nightmare is when I dream about being back in college and I'm showing up for a final exam to a class I've never been to or ever attended or paid attention to and I'm going, okay, now what do I do? And that's a, that's a nightmare for me, not being prepared for something like that, that important. And so all of us can recount a nightmare that comes up that you don't like to be a part of. I know that we all have those time and time again every once in a while and you kind of wonder why that happened why the nightmare appeared or came to be but it's soon forgotten but what about your most pleasant dream what's some of the most pleasant dreams you've ever had can you think of some of your most pleasant dreams i mean you can kind of just gaze back and think yeah i remember this dream because it's easier to remember the pleasant dreams more so than the nightmares um, I think my most pleasant dream, the dream that I woke up from when I was going, gee, I wish I didn't wake up, uh, I dreamt that I, was, that I died and gone to heaven. And I dreamt as I was going up to heaven, uh, the people I saw on the way to the gates, and I actually could see the gates, which is kind of cool. Um, and just the, the time going up there, the the beauty of what I saw in that dream and then the gates opened wide and everything was just brilliant and and beautiful and and the music that I was listening to was just unbelievable and so I was going this is it and I, and I was all excited about meeting Jesus so I was walking down this golden street going I'm gonna meet Jesus and I woke up I don't know, gee. Um, bad timing <laughs> or good timing I guess um, but we all have those pleasant dreams. And it seems like dreams are a part of, of life. And I can see, as you look in Scripture, there's a lot of recounts about dreams. And why this message came to my heart was mainly because I've heard people in the past talk to me about dreams, and that dreams really, when it comes to even just the physical dreams we have in our mind at sleep, that they don't mean anything and it doesn't mean that God's speaking in a certain way. Uh, I've talked to some godly men that said no dreams have nothing to do with God speaking to you and I kind of went really okay it, this doesn't seem right to me. But I think that dreams are a way that God speaks to us. So I'm going to say that. Uh, some people probably don't believe that but I believe that God will speak to us in dreams. There's a lot of times that I get up and in the middle of the uh, night, in the early, early morning hours, and, and a dream has appeared to me, and, and I write it down because it ends up being something that God wanted me to, or at least it seems to me to, anyways, that I needed to speak about in a message. And I've read, wrote a lot of my sermons between three and four in the morning uh, because it was fresh in my mind of what had to be said. Of course, they get fleshed out as it goes through, and I study more about it. But, you know, it's an inter interesting thing about dreams, and that's why I wanted to kind of talk about that today, to see what dreams are all about, and that they're important, that there are certain dreams that are God-purposed, brought out by God, and there are certain dreams that men dream, that we as human beings dream, such as goals and aspirations. So there's two different ways of looking at what a dream is. So the questions I have here that help us underscore today's message are a couple things here. For one, is do you think dreams are an important part of our Christian walk? That's one question we can kind of ask. Do you think it's important to our how we walk and how we serve God, the dreams that we have? 
And does God use dreams for his purpose? Or is it just a simple natural experience? That's the two questions that we're going to be looking at today. If you go through the message. So what I want to first focus on is just the, the main passage that comes to mind that I saw in Acts chapter 2. So in your Bible, if you have your Bible, you turn to Acts chapter 2. If you don't have your Bible, there's Bibles in the pew. And if you have the occasion to have your Bible on your phone, and when the app should go to Acts chapter 2, and we're going to be concentrating in chapter 17, Acts 2.17. And I will read it, and you can kind of just read along with me. Now what the background of this verse is about is that at the time of Pentecost, Peter went out and gave his first real moving sermon based on the Holy Spirit that was actually indwelled in him and he had to say it. He had to get this sermon out. And so this is a part of Peter's address to the crowd at the front part of Acts. And then Peter said this in verse 17. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. So it was even in scripture talking about that. And once again, I'll say it. In the last days, in verse 17, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people, your sons and daughters will prophecy. Your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. And I've kind of covered that whole gambit. I was a young man at one time, <laughs> and I saw visions of what I needed to do. Now I'm an old man, and all I do is just dream. <laughs> But the thing is, is that we can kind of attest to that. When it says men dream dreams, that men means all people. Because dreams are not relegated just to mankind or just men. It's, it's, uh, there's some beautiful dreams I'm sure that women have dreamt. I can recount a couple of them that I know of. That's even in the Bible. So what is the definition of the natural dream? When you define it, dreams are a universal human experience that can be described as a state of consciousness characterized by sensory, cognitive, and emotional occurrences during sleep. That's a fancy psychological word for saying that you just have a lot of things going on in your mind that comes out in some sensory feedback in your mind. There's some stats that I pulled up about dreaming and it's interesting to find out that we may not remember dreaming, but we are thought to dream between three and six times a night. And I've never really got up and started counting my, my dreams, but I know that, and I think the strangest dreams is when you get up and you walk around, you go back to sleep, and you're right before you get up to go to work, the dreams are the strangest about that time. I'm not too sure why that is, but it happens to me that way. It is thought that each dream lasts between five to 20 minutes. So they're not very long, these mental things that we have come into our minds. And here's a neat fact, it says about 95% of dreams are forgotten by the time the person gets out of bed. Yeah, unless your spouse elbows you and says, boy, this was a terrible dream I just had, and you have to listen to it while you're trying to get back to sleep. <laughs> But the thing is, is that you have these dreams, and that's some of just the basic stats about those. What a dream is all about. And dreams are important, I think. There's a, there's a quote by uh, Robert Goddard. Robert H. Goddard was the rocket scientist. If you ever wanted to meet a rocket scientist, Goddard was the one. He was one that actually developed and first brought out rockets. Well, he said something about dreaming, because he dreamt all the time. He said that it is difficult to say what is impossible, for the dream of yesterday is the hope of today and the reality of tomorrow. So he was pretty deep when it comes to that as far as the philosophy of that as it goes. 
But there are purposes when it comes to dreams, I think. And you might agree with me on this. I mean, there's probably three different areas that you can see where dreams are purposeful. Physically, they're purposeful. Biblically, we'll see that there are a purpose behind the, the dreams biblically. And then emotionally, we need to have dreams. Physically, when we go to sleep, we dream to, I think, we dream to flush out what's in our minds. What went on that day or the day before, and what you're thinking about what's going to happen the next day. Sometimes come into a part of a dream at night. It's what our mind wants to bring forth. And it mainly is centered in what we are concerned about. Biblically, we can attest that a dream is used by God to reveal His will, His plan for us. It gives us a glimpse of the future even. Some dreams do, especially the dream that I have going to heaven because I know I am going to heaven. And so I get a glimpse of that. And I don't know if that's God's way of encouraging me or just having the blessing of a, a nice dream. But they're also used by God to encourage us and to instruct us. So there's the biblical side of that. And then emotionally, when it comes to the emotional side of dreaming, that comes into the point of where we're aspiring to a goal. Where you dream about certain things that you want to attain or to gain or to achieve throughout your life. That's a dream that's not so much in your mind, but it's what's in your heart. Those dreams are meant to motivate us along our way, along our w walk with God. And, and it's a neat thing to look at that we have these three purposes within a dream. So really, dreams are important. I think we can all agree with that. They're a part of our life, even as we all are daydreaming right now. <laughs> Caught you, didn't I? <laughs> But Christian author Chuck Swindoll spoke very highly about dreamers and dreams and what it's all about. And he wrote in his book, called, it's called The Quest for Character. And he said that, that what's behind great accomplishments inevitably is great people. But what is in those great people that makes them so different? It's certainly not their age or their sex or color or heritage or environment. No, it's got to be something inside their heads. These are people who think differently. We're talking about dreams emotionally here. People whose ideas are woven into a meaningful pattern on the loom of dreams, threaded in, with colorful strands of, Im of imagination, creativity, even a touch of fantasy. They are among that band of young men that Scripture mentions who will dream dreams and see visions. And so Chuck Swindoll kind of gave us a glimpse, too, of what dreaming is all about and how important that is in that book that he had, talking about the quest for character. <coughs> now, God purposes dreams. So what we've seen now is pretty much so a definition of what dreams are. We looked at the Webster's definition of a dream being a cognitive thing. We looked at the purposes behind dreams and why they're important to us. But what's really important is that God lays in dreams into our minds to serve His purposes. And that's what I believe. And that's why I'm bringing it out today. And to prove my point, or prove the point that's in here, is that you see in Scripture it lays out various different things that talks about dreams. So in Daniel 1.17, that's the next place we're going to be going into. So if you're really quick with your Bibles, you can go into the Old Testament and go into Daniel, which is right next to Ezekiel. Uh, it's kind of neat how they're back to back because both of those are very prophetic books in the Old Testament. But Daniel talks about these dreams. And when you study through all of Daniel, you'll see that there is a series of dreams that not only did he interpret for Nebuchadnezzar and Darius, but he also had dreams and visions himself. There's instances really that are brought out very clearly about four times within the book of Daniel. But in Daniel 1.17, 
it lays out the foundation of what it means and how God used dreams in Daniel's life in order to serve God's purpose and not Daniel's so much. And it says in Daniel 1.17, to these four young men, talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, along with Daniel, those four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. It's interesting that it says God gave them this understanding, gave them this knowledge. But it goes on in verse 17, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. Quite frankly, you'll see as if you are a studier of the spiritual gifts, one of those things are interpretations of dreams and visions. Daniel had this, this gift to understand visions that he was having, and then more so dreams that great kings were even having. And they served God's purpose. You can see as you go through the book of Daniel, in chapter 2, 18 through 23, it talks about a couple of his dreams that came about. And I'm right at it right here, 18. It says, Daniel returned to his house and explained to his master. And he urged him to plead for his mercy for God concerning the mystery so that his friends might not be executed. What was happening was that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and he called in all the wise men to interpret his dream. None of the wise men in all of Babylon could interpret this dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. And this is the first of many that Nebuchadnezzar did uh, have when it came to his dreams. But this dream was a dream about a great statue. And he couldn't understand what the different parts of the statue were uh, about. And the wise men and all the main wise and learned people came and could not interpret. And so Nebuchadnezzar said, I'm going to kill everybody that thinks that they're wise and cannot interpret my dream, so I'm going to just destroy everybody. And so Daniel was a part of that wise men group, if you will, and along with his friends. He was saying, hey, we might be killed here. And so he asked God, to spare them. And in verse 19, during that, the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised God in heaven and said, Praise be the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. You know, it's almost the same type of prayer we could have today. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. And Daniel continues on with this prayer of thanksgiving. He reveals the deep and hidden things he knows what lies in darkness, and light dwells within him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. And so what Daniel did, outside of what the other wise men did in Babylon, is that Daniel came to God for help and asked him to bring out that dream and allow him to interpret that dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. And of course, Daniel did interpret it correctly, and the king was satisfied, and they were then spared. That was just one instance. There was another instance of Nebuchadnezzar's dream of a great tree that was in the middle of this field that was cut down to just about the, where the stump was at. And, Dan, and Nebuchadnezzar couldn't understand what this dream was about this great tree that was beautiful and provided all this shelter for the birds and, and fruit from its branches, but it was then cut down and destroyed. And he said, oh wise people in my kingdom, tell me what this dream's all about. Nobody could give an answer to it. But then Daniel said to God, can you help me out? And God then provided the answer to Daniel at that point in time as far as what that interpretation was. And if you want to, in your quiet time, you'll see that whole story brought out in chapter 4 of Daniel. And it goes from 4, uh, verse 1 through 37. So in your quiet time, you can write in your bulletin. Go to that, because it's kind of neat about what he said about that great tree. Daniel 4, verses 1 through 37. That 
dream was interpreted by Daniel to tell the king that it was a lesson in humility that this great kingdom of Babylon is going to be cut down to the quick. And that where it once was providing for a lot of people was no longer going to be providing for any much of it, anything except just a stump. So that's what that prayer is all about at that point in time also in Daniel's interpretations. And as you go into Daniel even more so, it's, it's interesting that this book about Daniel speaks an awful lot about dreams because in Daniel, he then starts seeing visions and dreams. And in Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 through 28, you go down deeper into his book and you see in 7, verses 1 through 28, it talks about the four beasts. And there's different beasts that he saw in his vision. And that, those beasts were talked about the conflict that's going to occur in the future times during the tribulation in the present church age and beyond. And that vision was given to God to tell those around in the country of Babylon and also all the people that were listening to Daniel's vision. They talked about the battle that was going to be happening between Christ and his followers and the Antichrist. So that is an underscore, or it helps back up what we see in Revelation. Then the last of, of Daniel's visions, he had two that really were key, was in Daniel 10 and going in through to Daniel 12. And that's where then the book ends. But that vision talked about mainly the restoration of Israel by God. So you, you see here in Scripture, if somebody tells you that dreams aren't important to God and they're not used by God, well, they're wrong because we just went through a real quick rendition of the dreams and visions that Daniel had between himself and Nebuchadnezzar and, and other kings there along the way. And we could see how those dreams and the interpretation of those dreams and the visions that Daniel had allowed God's purpose to be fulfilled in the nation of Babylon and also in the nation of Israel. But then if we travel into and go into the New Testament, you're saying, okay, yeah, I can see where there's a lot of Old Testament dreams because that just seemed to happen an awful lot back in the Old Testament times. But what about dreams in the New Testament? Can you think of any New Testament dreams? I can think of a whole bunch of New Testament dreams. The key that comes to my mind is that, huh, think of poor Mary in the situation that she was in, about to be married, but also pregnant. And she was married to a very strict Jewish man, or about to be married, <clears throat> and, then, <clears throat> excuse me, and Joseph had every right to divorce her before the marriage, stop the engagement, and he even could go as far as to stone her to death by Mosaic law. But what happened to Joseph? Did he carry out the stoning of Mary? No, because if that was the case, our Lord Jesus Christ would not have experienced the birth of Bethlehem and been among us. So God used a dream to Joseph. Because when you go into Matthew, this is a neat story, I like going into it. You go into Matthew and it talks about his dream that took place. And it's the one that was right there before the birth. Matthew chapter 1 verses 20 through 23. <clears throat> And I'll go ahead and go into 18. So Matthew 1, verse 18, it says, This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Now you talk about miracles. There's one miracle I'm never ever going to see again. But there's that miracle. Mary was pregnant. And verse 19 says, Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had a mind to divorce her quietly. 
So he did, was not going to stone her to death as he could, but he was planning on divorcing her quietly so not to bring disgrace to the family or to her. And in verse 20 carries on, but after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit and she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. A beautiful story revealed in a dream. So when somebody says dreams aren't used by God to fulfill his purpose, there's your clear and shining example <laughs> of how God uses <clears throat> dreams to fulfill his purpose because he fulfilled his purpose in a grand and glorious way. But then it came to more dreams that Joseph had. And it's interesting that these important dreams come more than just one time. They come in twice, three or four times. And so Matthew then receives another dream and is given one to be what I call the life-saving dream of all mankind. Because we can see in Matthew 2.13 what was taking place then at that point in time also. When he had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Why did they have to escape to Egypt? Well, you know the story. Herod was going to kill every male child all around that region as to save his dominion and his reign. And so the Lord protected Jesus and Mary and Joseph and they told in a dream get up and go to Egypt stay there until I tell you for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him so verse 14 Matthew 2 14 says this so he got up took the child and his mother during the night and they left for Egypt where they stayed until the death of Herod and so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet out of Egypt I call my son so not only do dreams protect us and are used by God's purpose, but they also fulfill scripture. As we can see here, both times that that dream occurred to Joseph, it fell right in line with prophecy that took place before Joseph and Mary even knew each other. And so it's all in God's work, how that all took place. Dr. David Jeremiah says in a sermon that God plants his dreams in our hearts to fulfill his purpose on earth. And God uses dreams for his purpose and those dreams can even direct our paths according to God's will and not our own. And we have to lean on that. We have to understand that. And God's purpose in our dreams happened in the Old Testament times. It happened in the New Testament times. And dare I say, it even happens today. <laughs> so when you dream a dream, taking into account how God is working in that dream for your betterment and for his purpose to fulfill his plan and his will for you. So we should not discount any type of dream that comes along. But there's another side to dreams. We looked at the, the definition of dreams and the purpose behind dreams. We learned that dreams are important physically to ourselves and that they are part of what's been mentioned in the Bible with a few quick examples. But there are also man-directed dreams, dreams that we look at and it's more or less the noun form of dream where it talks about our aspirations and our goals. And you can almost think back to where you were at as a young woman or a young man as to where you are right now. And you can recount back what dreams and aspirations you had and see whether those dreams and aspirations were meant 
or if there are other dreams and aspirations even now that need to be taken care of. That's another aspect of dreaming. I've always dreamt of preaching. Now I've done it. I've always dreamt of having my doctorate. I got it. You know, and there's dreams that I aspire to. I wanted to be an officer in the military. I became that too. I wanted to get married to a wonderful woman. I got married to a wonderful woman. So my Lord has watched me along the way and allowed my dreams to come. And I kind of wonder what's next. Well, I know what's next. What next is my main aspiration is to save as many people as I can from eternal damnation <laughs> and preach on and preach on and preach on until the day I die. Amen. And so that's my dream, people. I'm going to share it with you because I love you all. <laughs> that's what I aspire to. And God's going to see to it when it happens how that aspiration is going to be met. But it's a dream all the same. There's a lot of dreamers in the Bible when you think about it. I mean, think. Let's see. Paul. Talk about a dreamer. He wanted to sit there and stay back where it was nice and safe around the Antioch area and Jerusalem and that area where there were Jews plentiful and there were people that he could actually talk to. But God said, no, 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 no. Your aspiration of just staying around here is now going to be changed. Your aspirations need to take on a different light. And you need to, Paul, reach out to all the Gentiles. And I'm sending you to Troas, into Macedonia, which is now the present day Turkey. And he sent him over there. You see that when you look at Acts 16.9. It says that during the night, Paul had a vision of a man in Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. That was a dream that... Paul had in Acts 16.9. You can write that down and check that out in your quiet time also. But that was his dream. Abraham dreamed of having children. And you know that they ended up having children way, way late in age. But God provided that dream and he gave not only Abraham offspring, but he became the father of many nations. And that all started when you look in Genesis 17, 6. It talks about that dream. Joseph in the Old Testament, his dreams were of leadership. And leadership in Egypt became an actual dream that he, was, that he attained. But that dream of being a leader carried on through there in Egypt to the point where he actually provided for his own people, his own brothers who threw him into that hole. It was now a dream that was provided where he could then show them the love and compassion of God that his family, his brothers especially, did not show. Joshua dreamed of conquering the promised land for the nation of Israel, and his prayers of encouragement came along the way when God said, Be strong and courageous, for I am with you. Because, see, Joshua dreamt of following Moses' footsteps, and leading that nation into the promised land, which was scary at most, but he had that dream, that aspiration, and because of that, Israel became a nation and fulfilled what was promised in Scripture. Solomon dreamed in 1 Kings 3, verse 5, talked about his dream of receiving wisdom and knowledge rather than great wealth. And God provided him with wisdom. He was 